or independent democratic Czechoslovakia in the spring of 1945, the end of the European war meant a return to peace and to the freedom it had not known since 1938. But already symbols of Czechoslovakia's powerful neighbor to the east, Russia, were reminders of the Soviets' ever-increasing domination. And in the elections in May of 1946, the communists, although winning little over a third of the popular vote, became the largest single political party. Thus, the communists were able to put their leaders in key positions and Moscow-trained communist Clement Gottwald was installed as Czechoslovakia's prime minister. Throughout the Republic and its ancient capital city of Prague, the Czech people, seemingly unaware of the implications of Gottwald's ascent to power, were busy clearing away the wreckage of the past. Reminders of the sorrowful years of the Nazi occupation were everywhere in the city streets. Memorials to soldiers and the workers of the underground who died to resist oppression. And to Hradšany Castle, resident of Czechoslovakia's respected leader, who was re-elected president by the unanimous vote of the National Assembly, the Czech people looked for guidance. For able, experienced Edward Benesch had seen many governments come and go. But he well knew that the task of maintaining the delicate balance upon which his country's independence rested might prove the most demanding of his long career. For the post-war Czechoslovakia he led was all but surrounded by Russia and Russian-dominated territory. Only through the American zone of Germany did the nation look out upon the West. Even before the war's end, Menesh knew that Czech foreign policy would have to be strongly oriented toward Moscow. Accepting this basic fact, he made a mutual assistance treaty with Russia and later ceded to it the province of Ruthenia, mainly inhabited by Ukrainians. On his return to Prague in 1945, after more than six years of exile, Menesh was greeted as a hero by his people. Mindful of Benesch's long labors on behalf of international cooperation at the League of Nations before the war, the nation looked to him to lead it out of its dilemma into security and peace. For in him was centered the hope of the Czechoslovaks that their small country might somehow maintain its working alliance with Russia without severing its traditional friendship with the Western democracies. Already, Eduard Benesch had seen Czechoslovakia through many disasters and sorrows. After the First World War was over, the Declaration of Independence and set its boundaries. Chiefly responsible among Allied statesmen for setting up the new republic was the late great American president, Woodrow Wilson outstanding personality among the big four at the conference. Carved out of parts of the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, Czechoslovakia was one of nine new European nations created after the First World War. Cosmopolitan center of the young republic was the city of Prague, whose population was a cross-section of the nation's many racial strains. And holding together its heterogeneous people in a unified nation was its great founder, Thomas Garig Masaryk, the George Washington of Czechoslovakia. As first president, he succeeded in creating an intense and vital national spirit among his people. At his death in 1937, Masaryk left behind the nation firm in the ways of democracy. To his place as president had come Edward Benesch, his devoted disciple, who played an active part in the Republic's struggle for independence and served it well as premier and foreign minister. Under Masaryk and Benesch, 
Czechoslovakia was an agreeable country to live in. In the years between the two world wars, it became one of the great industrial nations of Europe. Situated on the Danube, Central Europe's principal river, Bratislava became the key port through which Czechoslovakia carried on her extensive trade with the nations of the world. Its industrial growth was balanced by increased agricultural productivity. The Slovakian farmlands and pastures were soon producing many times what they had produced during the days of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. By their hard work and enterprise, the Czechs raised their standard of living to one of the highest among the nations of Europe. In the markets and shops, delicacies to tempt the most discriminating palate were always on display. In its prosperity, Czechoslovakia felt secure and happy. But into this peaceful land in the mid-1930s came the first ominous rumblings of trouble. In the Sudeten area of Czechoslovakia, over two million Czech citizens of German origin were hailing the rise of Nazism just across the German border. Spurred on by Hitler's stooges like sinister Konrad Henlein, the people of the Sudetenland were roused to frenzied support of the Nazis. Betraying their own country, the Sudeten Nazis demanded that the Sudetenland be handed over to Hitler. At the Munich conference in the dark days of September 1938, the Western powers abandoned Czechoslovakia and in a final attempt to appease Hitler, agreed to her partition. With the Sudeten land in his hands, Hitler took the next step of aggression six months later when he triumphantly entered Prague as a conqueror and announced that Czechoslovakia no longer existed save as a German protectorate. In his path, Hitler left many grim reminders of his six-year rule. Symbol of inhumanity for all time to come is the lost town of Lidice, razed to the ground and its inhabitants coldly murdered by Hitler's hangman. But out of the desolation of the Second World War came Czechoslovakia's rebirth, this time with Benesh, returned from exile again its leader. In the spring of 1946, the campaign to elect Czechoslovakia's first post-war parliament got underway. Among all major parties, it was understood in advance that in the interests of national unity, a government should be formed in which each party would be represented. To the Czechs, the democratic election procedure was nothing new, for their nation had been one of the most progressive democracies of the pre-war world. In this election, Every citizen over 18 was required by law to vote. Over seven million went to the polls. When the votes were counted, the Communist Party was in the lead with 114 of the 300 seats in the new Constituent Assembly, where all delegates confirmed their allegiance to the state by shaking hands with the Prime Minister of the outgoing provisional government, Zdeněk Fehlinger. As the new Prime Minister, Communist Clement Gottwald prepared to head the coalition cabinet. From the official residence, President Benesh issued a hopeful declaration of the political aims of reborn Czechoslovakia. Reorganizujeme v duchu důsledné demokracie politické a hospodářské svůj stát, aby mohl hrát svou tradiční roli pevného středoevropského mírového činitele v novém společenství národů jež vzešlo z těžkých zkoušek této války v organizaci spojených národů. To these aims, prompt economic reconstruction was vital. One of the first necessities was to rebuild Czechoslovakia's badly damaged transportation system. The hundreds of bridges and thousands of kilometers of railroad track destroyed in the fighting which had swept the country. To compensate for the manpower shortage, 
Every able-bodied Czech donated part of his spare time. To Czechoslovakia in its reconstruction efforts, U.S. Ambassador Lawrence Steinhardt brought the friendship and support of the United States. Three years' service as ambassador to Russia had made him well aware of the influence which Russia could bring to bear upon her small neighbor to the West. And his close friendship with the Czech foreign minister, Jan Masaryk, deepened his concern for Czechoslovakia's future. Steinhardt shared in the Czech's eager welcome of the contributions made by the United States to UNRWA, which shipped into Czechoslovakia over $200 million worth of supplies to start them on the road to recovery. With machinery from UNRWA, the farmers were able to produce good harvests, and the nation escaped the famines which overtook many neighboring countries. Cattle from American ranges were fattened and multiplied on the fertile plains of Bohemia. The work of rehousing the thousands who lost their homes in the war was fast advanced, and Czechoslovakia extended its system of low-cost housing, which before the war was one of the most progressive in Europe. High priority on the task of economic reconstruction was given to the work of restoring mills and factories to enable Czechoslovakia to regain her pre-war position as the industrial leader of Central Europe. Aided by labor of war prisoners and careful salvage, the restoration of the nation's industry was progressing fast in the first two years of peace. But to the nation's economic life, the post-war order brought great changes. For by one of the first post-war decrees, nearly all key industries were ordered nationalized. State property was marked on all large factories, and workers' councils ran them under state-appointed managers. Though handicapped by a lack of business experience and by labor shortages, the managers were able to keep production at a high level. The biggest of all the nationalized industries, the world-famous Škoda Works, sent a substantial share of its output to Russia, which already had a decisive voice in Czechoslovakia's economic affairs. Despite peacetime needs, Škoda is still equipped to produce arms and the heavy tools of war. Ever since the end of World War II, Russia's interest in Czechoslovakia had increased steadily following a pattern all too familiar to the peoples of Eastern Europe. Before the week of sustained crisis in February 1948, Communist Premier Gottwald had taken aggressive action in his campaign to turn the country into a communist state. Through a series of carefully plotted communist moves throughout the Republic, Gottwald marshaled his strength to force the resignation of anti-communists from the government. With characteristic party discipline, his orders were followed in detail by communist action committees. And to demonstrate his strength and purposes, his henchmen threatened a nationwide token strike. Finally, the communist coup was totally successful, and the victors celebrated in the streets of Prague. But before Red Victory rallies had ended, the conscience of the Czech people was abruptly sobered by the sudden and mysterious death of the popular son of the nation's founder and its foreign minister, Jan Masaryk. And to the minds of the saddened populace came the memory of the political ideals of Thomas Masaryk, as restated by his statesman son. Ideals which many of Czechs still hoped would live again. The people in America and in England know very well how my father believed in individual liberty, in politics, in religion, and that democracy, real democracy, was his life struggle and his life success and his life ideal. And these ideals we cannot and we will not give up.
whatever happens. Our conscience is clear and we are looking to the next days and weeks, quietly, without much excitement, but with firm determination in our hearts not to give up the only ethical values which will save Europe in the end.